Well, uh, thank you so much, Rachel. And my name is Mariana Sears. I am the executive director of the Media um, Fair Trade Committee in Media, Pennsylvania. Uh, Media is the first fair trade town in the United States, in America. And we are, for those of you who don't know where we are located, we are about 30 minutes outside Philadelphia. Everybody knows the big, beautiful, love city of Philadelphia. Uh, and today we're joining efforts with the members of the Philadelphia Fair Trade Committee. Uh, Rachel is representing them today. Uh, and we are also having other sister campaigns joining us uh, to celebrate Valentine's Day. Uh, members of the Pencrest High School, which is the first fair trade town, the first fair trade high school of the United States, and also members of Penn State University at Brandywine. Um, and we're all joining efforts together to celebrate Valentine's Day. Uh, and we want to do so honoring the cocoa farmers around the world who grow these magical and amazing plants that give out cocoa beans, out of which people make chocolate. And who doesn't love chocolate, right? Yeah. So fair trade advocates around the world um, are committed to buy fair trade chocolate. And in doing so, we like to support and um, um, dignify uh, the hard work of farmers who grow these this magical and amazing plants. So without further ado, I'm going to pass it to Rachel Spence, a member of Fair, uh, Fair Trade Philadelphia, who is going to introduce our speaker. And we're going to start right now our program. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Mariana. Um, hi everyone, I'm Rachel from Fairtrade Philadelphia, and I also work for the Fairtrade Federation. Um, I'm really happy to be with you all today and to be working with our friends at Media Fairtrade and Dr. Bronner's for this event. Um, I see a number of Fairtrade Philly members with us today, um, Yoko, Julie, Becca, and um, for those of you who might follow us on social media, um, or are a part of our Slack channel. We have a pretty active Slack channel if you'd like to join. Um, you may have seen that one of our members, Julie, did a wonderful video trying all of the Dr. Bronner's chocolate bars. So if you haven't seen it, um, you can check it out on our social media pages. So um, first, Ryan, thank you for joining us. Um, Ryan is the regenerative project manager at Dr. Bronner's, where he focuses on um, international supply chains and farmer training. Ryan is also the director of Grow Ahead, um, which is a cloud funding um, platform that um, brings together contributions from individuals, businesses, and organizations to fund community-led projects that address the local challenges of climate change around the world. So, um, Ryan has worked in the food and farm justice movement for many years with organizations such as the Center for International Law, the Friends of the Earth Paraguay, Global Exchange, and the Organic Consumers Association. Um, without further ado, I will pass it off to Ryan to, uh, to give his presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rachel. Thank you so much, uh, Mariana. I just want to say how excited I am to be able to, to be online with all the fine folks from media in, in Philly. Um, you know, you have that like this deep experience of being the first fair trade town um, in the United States, and that's such a, an amazing uh, achievement. And so I feel really sort of honored to be able to, to join you all today and talk a little bit about some of our experiences in the broader world of fair trade. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, so that we can all see. Um, all right, as, uh, as Rachel said, my name is Ryan Zinn. And I've been working with Dr. Bronner's now for some 12 years or so. Um, and my main job is focusing primarily on working um, with our farmer partners all over the world. Um, and we actually have a dedicated team that works really directly with farmers either through projects that we've basically set up over the years or 
um, that we work really closely with. Um, and so one of the big questions I think that many people are probably asking themselves is like, how the heck does a soap company um, make its way all the way to chocolate? So um, this really kind of in a way speaks a little bit about our experience in fair trade. Um, so let me see if I can advance this. So here, this gives you an idea of all of the places where we work. Um, and some of the reasons why we've decided to approach fair trade in the way we do is about 20 years ago, the, the Bronner family um, actually made this commitment to transition all of the raw materials, all of the ingredients that go into our soaps to organic sources. Um, and what we quickly realized was that by simply making that transition to organic raw materials and ingredients really wasn't enough. We had no idea what was happening on the ground with farmers, what the working conditions were like, whether farmers were uh, being paid fairly for their harvest. And so that really drove us to actually set up our own projects. And so we actually set up the world's first organic and fair trade coconut oil um, operation in Sri Lanka. And from there, what we tried to do is basically follow that same model. Um, by working with small farmer organizations throughout the world to set up what we call, you know, in sort of technical terms, you know, vertically integrated or really direct trade, fair trade projects that allows us to have a really close relationships with farmers. And one of the things that we did as well was actually build and invest in the infrastructure so farmers can focus on what they do best, which is growing food, fiber, you know, in our particular case, things like coconut oil or palm oil. Um, and we basically created an infrastructure like uh, mills um, and distillation units so they can actually sell their harvest um, at a premium under a fair price. And we can actually develop long term relationships, not only with those farmers, um, but really in the communities themselves. Um, and so really our emergence and sort of connection to chocolate actually grew out of our project in Ghana and West Africa, where a lot of the farmers where we work with actually grow cocoa as well. Um, and what we found was that they were basically just selling that cocoa onto the conventional marketplace um, way below the cost of production and really were having a hard time to survive. And so our goal was to slowly transition them um, to organic and fair trade to be able to then uh, sell that cocoa into the premium market, mostly to fair traders um, in Europe who are willing to pay for that premium. But as you can see, our approach has been to work really all over the world um, directly with farmers. And to this day, we probably work with about 10,000 farmers overall. Um, and one thing I just want to sort of put into context and one of the reasons that drives the work that we do really of late is that our biggest concern in this time and age is really looking at the impacts that climate change is having on small scale farmers and farm workers all over the world. What we've noticed is, is that in many cases, we tend to think about climate change as this sort of like far off idea that's, you know, not really impacting us. But in our experience, really, we've already seen this on the ground with farmers over the course of the last 20 years. Um, and one of the things that is often left out of this conversation is the fact that industrial agriculture, you know, that produces a lot of the food um, and fiber and fuel here in the United States, is actually one of the major contributors to climate change in terms of emissions. And so we see this as an opportunity, not only to address you know, the livelihoods of small scale farmers and farm workers all over the world, but to really address uh, climate change in a really proactive and meaningful way. And just to put this into context, some of you might have uh, read this fantastic book by Paul Hawken a little while ago, which talks about the most important tactics we can take to actually address climate change. And, Interestingly enough, agriculture actually plays a really important role, not only in reducing global greenhouse gas emissions, but potentially actually sequestering that uh, atmospheric carbon um, and putting it back into the soil where it belongs. So that's been one of the things that's been driving our work um, in the last couple of years. So what we're gonna talk about is a little bit about our journey um, to organic, fair trade and regenerative cocoa and chocolate. So you can see two of our farmer members here in the eastern region in Ghana. Um, they were part of our original cohort of farmers that took on this crazy idea of transitioning um, their fields uh, from the typical chemically intensive uh, conventional marketplace um, and you know, basically making a leap of faith and joining us on this organic fair trade and regenerative journey. So we're going to start off really quick with a couple of maybe interactive questions, and I don't know if I can actually see the uh, chat part of it. But if you want to go ahead and uh, answer in the chat, um, what region of the world did cocoa originally come from? I don't know if anybody's got any ideas or not. 
I threw up a couple of options here. One is the Congo, uh, the Amazon, um, Patagonia, or Polynesia. Um, all right, we got a couple of people that have put their uh, answers in the chat box. Um, perfect, all right, we'll give it a second or two more. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo, people are typing in. Um, and if you've answered Amazon, the answer is correct. So uh, cocoa actually originated um, through the development of indigenous peoples in the upper northwest portion of the Amazon, which is currently Colombia, uh, Ecuador, Peru, and Brazil. Um, and over time, what people found, indigenous peoples throughout the continent found was that cocoa you know, or cacao is such an amazing plant um, that it was something that needed to be spread far and wide. So you know, prior to colonization, what we saw was the expanse of cocoa up and down the Americas, and then it's now made its way to virtually every continent. So before we actually talk about all the great things that we're seeing in, in chocolate in our own supply chains with our partners, we have to talk a little bit about the problems with conventional chocolate. Um, so one of the things that we've noticed, particularly in West Africa, is, is that um, in many cases, farmers and farm workers really aren't um, able to actually live a dignified life because of the prices that they are paid um, from conventional chocolatiers is one that is far below uh, the, the level of poverty. Um, in addition to that, because the prices are so low, farmers often have, are forced to then expand out their land into protected areas or natural forests. And so we see a fair amount of uh, deforestation that's associated with conventional chocolate in West Africa and other places. Um, and because the prices are low, um, farmers are often forced to really rely on agrochemicals, especially fungicides in West Africa, to be able to um, try to eke out um, a very meager yield. And so I wanted just to show this little graphic here as a good idea of some of the bigger details that we're facing in the chocolate sector um, globally. And this was actually from a partner um, NGO network called the Voice Network that's based out of Europe, but has membership here in the United States, which includes uh, Green America, Fair World Project and others. And so this gives you an idea of some of the problems we're facing with conventional chocolate. This is the chocolate that has no organic or fair trade certification. Um, and this is pretty widespread. Um, prior to COVID, I, I would visit all of our partners in West Africa quite frequently, and it was very, very clear um, that those farmers that did not have that fair trade relationship with dedicated buyers, um, this was their lived reality. Um, and so this is something that I would say is a fantastic, huge challenge uh, for the chocolate industry. Similarly, one of the challenges that we face um, and one of the things that really underpins the fair trade relationship is that on the one hand, we've got millions of farmers um, that grow cocoa or any type of other crop, um, but the reality is, is everything in between farmers and us as consumers is really only controlled by a handful of players, whether that is on transportation or processing or manufacturing. It's really captured in this small amount of groups that has this massive control over the industry. As a result, that means less choice for us, but it means that farmers are basically price takers. These companies basically control the marketplace. And so if they say the price per ton of cocoa coming out of Ivory Coast, for example, um, is $1,000, well, quite frankly, that's all your options are. So one of the biggest challenges we're seeing in the conventional sphere is the massive concentration of the entire supply chain. And that means less choices for you as a consumer and ultimately uh, a life of poverty for farmers. All right, so moving on to the next question. Um, what country grows the most cocoa in the world? Uh, Ghana, Ivory Coast, Brazil, or Mexico? I don't know if you've got time to go ahead and put in to the chat box your answers. We see a couple coming in. Some people say Brazil, Ghana, Ivory Coast. Last chance. All right. The correct answer is Ivory Coast. So interestingly enough, though the Americas is the genetic and cultural home for cocoa, um, it's actually West Africa, Ghana and Ivory Coast that produces over 60% of the world's cocoa, which is pretty remarkable. It also means that those countries are 100% or not primarily dependent on the cocoa trade um, for all of their income. Um, so that means that it's both good and that they can actually, you know, potentially employ a lot of people. But the reality is that we saw in previous slides is the industry is so consolidated and controlled so much that it's really hard for even a country by itself that produces so much cocoa like Ivory Coast to even be able to negotiate with a lot of the cocoa manufacturers. So I wanna talk a little bit about what I call our vision at Dr. Bronner's um, for regenerative organic agriculture. So we've talked a little bit um, about some of the challenges in West Africa 
um, because farmers are generally operating on about four to five acres of land, um, they oftentimes are forced to really plant as densely as possible all of the cocoa to be able to try to eke out a living. And as a result, that creates a whole host of ecological and social problems. And so our approach has been really to address this from a different way. So at Dr. Bronner's and our partner projects in West Africa, we started first with organic and fair trade certification as a way to be able to create a basically a legal framework where we can actually compensate farmers with premiums to compensate them for all of the fine work that they're doing. That ensures a fair payment uh, for their harvest. It means that we provide ongoing technical support and services, but importantly, we also focus quite a bit on economic development. As we notice, there's a lot of that value that's taken out of the supply chain and away from farmers because um, basically other corporations can actually control the rest of that. So what we want to do is keep as much value um, as possible um, in the communities where we work. And I think that fair trade is actually one of the best ways to do that. Um, and so we've been able to develop in West Africa and Ghana, um, the world's first organic and fair trade palm oil operation, working with small scale farmers. And we mentioned engaging and working with farmers to transition their cocoa farms as well. So as a result, this really focuses on a couple of different core areas. One is soil health. This means that uh, the soils that farmers are producing on are far healthier, which produces greater yields, and it's much more resilient in the face of climate change. One thing that we've noticed uh, with both coffee and cocoa, just even a fraction of a degree um, in some of these communities at the wrong time of the year is enough to make uh, insect populations explode. And as a result, sometimes farmers are really reliant on agrochemicals. Our goal is to be able to build a system that's much more resilient for climate change diversify what farmers can produce so they're not relying on just Dr. Bronner's, they're not just relying on cocoa or oil palm or anything else, um, and they can actually build and create value in their own community. So one of the ways that we do this is actually investing in partnering with farmers um, to try to recreate the natural environment from which cocoa emerged in the upper Amazon. And what we do is this technique called agroforestry. It's kind of a food farm system that's built out of a forest type of landscape. Our goal is to mimic as much as possible what an actual forest would look like with all of these different crops. So as you can see here, what we've done is partnering with one farmer um, to replant his cocoa field, but by intercropping, mixing a whole bunch of different crops so that it actually provides both food for their family and their community. Um, it actually grows fertility with a number of different type of crops, but it also creates shade for cocoa. Um, otherwise, what we do is we force cocoa to try to survive out in the sun. Um, and all that does is create all sorts of problems like crop loss um, and pests and disease. So this approach is much more comprehensive and holistic. And it's where we've been focusing a fair amount of our efforts as part of our larger fair trade strategy, uh, particularly for West Africa. All right, one more uh, interactive question before we move on. All right, does anybody have any ideas how many cocoa beans it takes to make one pound of chocolate? 1,000, 50, 400, or 2,500? That's a good one. All right, we see a lot of answers so far. I think most people are shooting for the, the 1,000 range. Um, in fact, it takes about 400 uh, cocoa beans to actually make one pound of chocolate. Um, and really, you know, one of the things that we think about when we think about the production of cocoa um, that goes into chocolate, um, oftentimes we have this idea that farmers just do manual labor and there's really no skill involved in it. But in reality, um, creating actually quality chocolate is a, a heck of a hard job. And that requires harvesting the cocoa at the right time. It means that farmers are actually fermenting the beans on their farm to ensure that you actually have good flavor. That's how you get the flavor, that chocolate flavor is through the fermentation process. And then farmers have to dry that, those cocoa beans uh, before it's actually sent to make chocolate. So it actually takes quite a bit of work even after you've already harvested that chocolate. So our goal really with Dr. Bronner's was figuring out how do we begin to support all of the different supply chains and partners that we work with. So we started first by transitioning those cocoa farmers in our network over to organic and fair trade to ensure that they had a long-term stable fair relationship with a dedicated buyer. But as you can see, we're not also, we're not just making, you know, 100% pure cacao um, products, right? We're actually incorporating a lot of other ingredients. So our goal, um, as we showed in that first map, was to really focus on trying to source and partner with farmers organizations as much as possible to ensure that virtually every single ingredient that we could source was organic, was fair trade, 
um, and that was regenerative that really focuses on this climate resilience and soil health. So as a result, what we've done is, is partner with farmers now um, pretty much all over the world. We source all of our sweetener, this coconut sugar from a fantastic women's cooperative in Indonesia that's Fair for Life certified. Um, we've actually been working with some um, farmers um, in places like Spain and Italy who are now seeing their livelihoods decimate as they nobody wants to work the countryside. So for things like almonds, for example, and hazelnuts. Um, and we were looking like, to partner with our project in Seren Seren Sri Lanka called Serendipol for all of the coconut byproducts as well that go into our chocolate. So really our goal is to be as comprehensive and as impactful in our approach to creating this new chocolate line to actually ensure that the benefits actually are delivered directly to the communities with which we partner. So I heard there was a, 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 a taste test um, with all of the different uh, flavors. So I, I'd love to hear what uh, people uh, like the most. Mm -hmm. So now as we head going forward, you know, one of the biggest things that we've noticed our particular experience going from primarily a soap company um, to now getting a little bit more involved in the food world is that um, there's a couple of you know, key kind of takeaways or lessons that we've learned so far is one, uh, we've actually been collaborating quite a bit um, with many different suppliers and cooperatives um, and farmers associations to, to uh, build out this, this, this cocoa uh, um, supply chain that's fair, regenerative, organic. Um, what we found is that you know, by going it alone or working with just one group, uh, quite frankly, the impact is just not the same. And so we've been looking at working throughout West Africa um, in part because that's where we see the biggest um, opportunity to make a positive impact. And hopefully, you know, this example and this experience could actually be scaled out and spread across the region. Um, and I think, as I mentioned before, it's really those relationships with different farmers organizations that, that are critical. One of the things that we noticed heading into COVID, you know, some two years ago was that because there was so much disruption, because uh, communication was really, um, really sporadic, and because our team could not go directly and um, work and dig into some of the challenges facing um, farmers and their organizations. Um, without having that really close relationship, uh, farmers are oftentimes left at the mercy of the marketplace. Um, and then as us as Dr. Bronner's, then we are kind of left um, in the lurch and not have access to the raw materials that we need to make a product. So I can't underscore enough how important those relationships are um, that you have with farmers. And I, I don't want to say that, you know, there's a hierarchy of, of fair trade principles, but I think relationships are pretty high. Um, and then as consumers, one of the things that we're really encouraging people to do, you know, above and beyond Dr. Bronner's is to really demand, uh, you know, products that are both organic and fair trade certified. Um, this is really critical because, you know, we see out in the marketplace, lots of different products, and sometimes they're not organic certified. And really our approach and our philosophy, so to speak, is that um, we think that they really go both hand in hand. Farmers need to be paid, compensated fairly. Um, and at the same time, we don't want to expose them to dangerous chemicals in the same way that we don't want to eat those dangerous chemicals as well. And then lastly, um, because the scale of this challenge is so big, um, it's really, really important to look at systemic uh, approaches to challenging um, sort of the, the common you know, business as usual. So there's a number of great organizations that I encourage you to, to connect with um, here in the United States or, or internationally that are really looking at policies that can actually not only you know, facilitate farmers getting fair prices, but ensure that we don't have such challenges like uh, child labor or forced labor in West Africa, for example. And some of those organizations I've met so far, the Voice Network, they put out a fantastic report, I think every two years called the Cocoa Barometer, um, that really gives a great um, investigative approach to uh, the realities on the ground for cocoa farmers. And then there's other great, fantastic advocacy organizations here in the United States, including Great America and Fair World Project. And this allows us to do basically what I like to say, like chew gum and dance, is that we can actually have great impact with our dollars when we're at the supermarket or at our local natural food store or cooperative. But we can also focus some of that energy on engaging in policy at a much larger level. And with that, I will uh, hand it all over to you to see if you have any questions or, or thoughts. I, I want to say thank you so much for your time. I didn't want to drone on too much. And if you've got any really um, specific questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Great, thank you so much, Ryan. That was wonderful, very insightful. And um, yeah, so we were thinking we would open it up to Q&A to hear what um, folks wanna learn more about. And um, so we were thinking we could do this two ways. Either you can put your um, question in the chat or if you'd like to um, raise your hand, um, and I think you can do that on, uh, uh, I 
think it's on the bottom of the screen. Yes, there's a raise your hand button there. Um, and we can unmute you so you can ask your question directly. Um, while you're thinking of your questions, um, I did want to pass it over to Mariana real quick to talk about the Media Fair Trade Buying Club. Um, because they are featuring the Dr. Bronner's Magic Chocolate Bars this month. Yes, thank you, Rachel, and thank you, Ryan. Uh, the presentation was so interesting. I was just trying to, to try to digest all what you said, and I'm pretty sure that I'm going to come up with a few questions. But in any case, um, we're gonna we're gonna we are going to let people uh, go first with their questions and the comments. Uh, but uh, wanted to make sure that everybody who's interested in purchasing the magic bars um, can do so. Um, with us if, if wanted. We launched this month in celebration of Valentine's Day and in honoring this, this presentation, uh, we launched um, Fair Trade Buying Club and we are um, highlighting the bars. Um, we are offering them uh, at a really good price. So if you are interested, we'll, we're gonna put in the chat how to get your order going and you can visit our website uh, to see uh, which of them are you interested in and uh, how to, you know, send your payment and everything. We'll write it down. Great. And if any folks from Philadelphia are also interested, we have a member of the um, of Fair Trade Philly that has offered to go and pick it up from uh, media. So we'll have a drop off. Um, a, excuse me, a pickup location in Philadelphia as well. So you can also participate through this buying club. I've put the link in the chat if you wanna check it out more there. And uh, yeah, thank you so much, Mariana, for that. Um, great, and I think we have a few folks with questions um, so we can jump into that. I saw one in the chat that came through from Alex. Are there symbiotic plants for cocoa trees that support the soil and increased health? Um, besides providing shade? Yeah, what we've actually done in our approach um, is try to kind of come up with this sort of, you know, I call it like the Cadillac version of sort of planting uh, for, for crops. And so, for example, if a farmer is starting a fresh with a fresh field and we're not trying to rehabilitate an older cocoa uh, plant or, or plantation, um, our real goal is to try to come up with the right combination of plants. So early on, generally farmers will plant a seedlings that are probably anywhere between six months to 12 months old. We generally plant them next to bananas. And so bananas grow very quickly. It provides that uh, shade early on. Um, and that is really one of the biggest challenges for planting cocoa seedlings is sort of like that shade control as the rest of the trees grow up. Um, and then from there, we do a couple of different things. One, uh, we plant what we call like biomass, um, biomass plants. And so the idea is a lot of these create a lot of biomass, a lot of leaves and sticks and twigs and things like that that we then prune and then provide as mulch um, for, uh, for the trees themselves. And then in addition to that, uh, we also plant a number of shade trees that also um, have two roles. One, they provide shade, but they also are what we call nitrogen fixers. So they take all of the nitrogen out of the atmosphere, out of the air, and then fix that nitrogen into the ground. And so in a way, it's this like built-in living approach to fertilizing not only the cocoa trees, but other trees within the uh, agroforestry system as well. So those are the things that the main three categories. Okay, great. Um, Interesting. Yeah. Um, I see Ira has raised his hand. Oh, sorry, Mariana. Did you want to say Yes, that? no, I was going to read the question from David, um, but I don't know who's first. So <laughs> it's hard to do, there's so much in the chat. Oh, well, yeah. I go ahead with David and then you read okay, Iris. Perfect. Uh, David says that you mentioned Ryan, the Fair World Project here in the US, and he wants to know what are some of the other advocacy policy organizations we can talk to? Yeah, so I, one organization that's working particularly on the issue of child labor and cocoa is the Child Labor Coalition. Um, and so they're also a network of organizations as well, like pretty much sure that Farewell Project as well as Green America and others are members. And so a lot of their focus goes on to sort of getting into some of the nuts and bolts of uh, you know the, the policies focusing on addressing child labor, um, not just in cocoa, but I believe in another you know, crops and commodities as well. Um, and so some of you may be familiar with a number of different bills that there's been um, under consideration. Um, and in theory, the United States could potentially screen um, cocoa coming out of West Africa uh, for child labor. But the reality is like the infrastructure as such isn't there. There's so much I would say, you know, there's such a long supply chain from your, you know, 
let's say a Hershey's bar that doesn't have any type of organic or fair trade attributes all the way back to the farm. And there just really isn't great infrastructure now to, to do that. And by relying on some of these companies like, like Hershey's, for example, to do sort of like self-regulation, um, quite frankly, that just hasn't worked. So I think in the future, what we'd like to see is more focus on um, beefing up really the enforcement um, on the ground in places like Ivory Coast and in Ghana, as well as taking away the incentive to pay really poverty wages. Great, thank you. Um, Rachel, do you wanna read the one from Ira? So he's actually raised his hand, so I will oh. um, allow him to talk and it mm -hmm. should to you to Ira to uh, be unmuted. Are okay, you yeah, can you hear me? Yep, great. Okay, so hi, Ryan. Um, yeah, that was a, it was a lot of information in that presentation. And I'm pretty familiar with the work and I've been involved with, you know, I've, I've known about our organic consumers association. I first got involved with in the food industry when I was in like pretty much 1979 with local food co-op. And I have to say that I've seen a lot of trends come and go and a lot of fads and a lot of, you know, I don't know, but regenerative, I think, has taken off like nothing else, you know? You see regenerative everywhere. So how do you how do you guys maintain you know that what you're doing is authentic and um, you know it's not I don't know greenwashing. Yeah, that that is a great point, Ira. I imagine over the years you've seen lots of trends you know, come and go for for better or for worse. Oh, yeah. um, in our particular approach, really, uh, I would say started maybe about four or five years ago. We notice the same thing in the natural products world is that, you know, there is starting to be a greater connection with um, climate change and soil health and, and food, for example. And so a lot of companies, you know, started calling themselves regenerative. I think even like, you know, McDonald's and Walmart, like all sorts of people are starting to call themselves regenerative. Um, and so Dr. Bronner's um, and others, um, including some of your neighbors in, in uh in uh, Pennsylvania, the Red Oil Institute, as well as some other NGOs and companies like Patagonia, really focused on creating a framework and really a, another certification um, called Regenerative Organic Certified. Um, and the idea really here is to focus on not just, you know, this hyper um, attention on soil health, which is what a lot of the regenerative claims are looking at. They're not really focusing on things like, you know, you know, farmer welfare or, you know, the reality for farm workers or for animal welfare. And really our goal with this certification um, is to really bring together the real core fundamental certifications that we see as um, important for any type of consumer awareness. So that is um, organic certified as a requirement. Um, all products must have a fair trade certification. Um, so we incorporate the farmer and farm worker aspect as well. And then if it is an animal byproduct, it's meat, eggs, dairy, for example, it also has to have a high level animal welfare certification. So that has been our kind of contribution to this greater um, challenge going forward. I think some people want to go beyond organic or go beyond fair trade. Um, and then this is one way to do that. So if you're interested, I'd, I'd recommend folks take a look at the regenorganic.org. Um, that is the site where that it includes the... Um, the actual standard itself, it explains all of that goes into it. Um, and it's really a list of number of the brands that have participated uh, thus far. And, and Dr. Bronner's are three of our projects in Ghana, uh, Sri Lanka and India participated in the pilot are, and are now regenerative organic certified silver. Okay, thanks. And um, thank you, uh, Ira, for that question. Um, Rachel, do you want to read uh, the comment from Julie? This sure. yeah, so one of your volunteers. <laughs> yeah, this is Julie from Fair Trade Philly. Um, she says, "Hi, Ryan. My name is Julie. I'm a volunteer with Fair Trade Philadelphia. I did a sampling, the sampling review unboxing video um, that I mentioned earlier, and she really enjoyed the varieties in her research." about Dr. Bronner's, um, she was looking into the Sarandipalm project. Could you elaborate on how this project operates in terms of its relationship with people in the local community that it operates in? Are there benefits for women, children, or are people, um, or of uh, people of a certain socioeconomic class? Yep, absolutely. Um, so thank you for doing a little bit of investigation. So Sarandipalm is one of uh, Dr. Bronner's um, projects that we more or less um, own and operate. Um, and through the Fair Trade Fund, 
um, you know, our approach has been to engage the local community, um, farmers, farm workers, and then uh, folks that work at our, our factory. So we actually employ uh, 300 people um, most of the year um, at our factory that work and primarily focusing on uh, palm oil. Um, and so through that engagement and surveying, um, and review with our local staff. We've actually focused a fair amount of, if not most of our work um, on women and children's issues. And so uh, one of the issues that we actually focused on probably about four or five years ago as a result of feedback uh, for the community was actually investing and running, well, we don't, we don't run it, but we basically paid for a labor and delivery ward at the local clinic. What we noticed was that there was a fair amount of like maternal um, you know, deaths, both children and mothers. Um, and so by actually having a facility that could actually accommodate and take care of uh, newborns and moms was really, really critical and important. Um, the other issue that we've really worked on of late, um, one of the things that we noticed um, from the women that worked at our factory was that they loved the fact that they could actually um, have good, solid, you know, dignified and fair employment. Um, but they realized that there wasn't great educational opportunities for their children. Um, so after a lot of uh, discussion back and forth uh, with people in the community um, and the women that work at our factory, uh, we've just, we should help well, COVID permitting, uh, we will actually be launching a Montessori school for all uh, the children of the women um, or any person that is um, working at our factory or in the community itself. And so that I think will accommodate somewhere between 200 and 300 children. And our goal is to then be able to grow that out over time. So this will be just primarily primary uh, school for now. Um, but the idea is to add secondary and high school um, as the children go older and we're able to raise more funds. And then lastly, um, one of the things that we've been hearing quite a bit from uh, women in the community, especially young women in school, is just uh, resources for family planning. Um, a lot of the clinics are locally that just don't have the resources to be able to do that. Um, and it's a little bit of a political issue as well. And so we've been able to support with a number of trainings and workshops at the request particularly around family planning. Um, so th those are the probably the, the top level things that we've worked on primarily in Ghana. Um, we've had other projects that address those issues in places like India and Samoa as well. Very exciting. <laughs> Great, and Mariana, did you mention that you had a question or two? Yes, and I, 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 I thought that someone raised their hand, but I don't know if that was some, by mistake. I don't see anybody now, but in any case, yeah, uh, Ryan, I was um, curious, fascinated and curious when you explained that one of the most important principles uh, of, of fair trade is actually the relationships that you build with the farmers. How, how do you start a relationship with a farmer? What does it take and how do you find them? And uh, why isn't, and this, this may not, you know, you may not know, who knows, but why aren't other chocolate companies trying to build those direct relationships? Um, and instead they're trusting that terrible, old fashioned, <laughs> not very nice um, uh, supply chain that, you know, that we are working so hard to get rid of. Yeah, I don't know if it makes sense, but. Yeah, I, I think I understand it. Um, <laughs> so I think there's like two ways to think about it. One, you know, there are in existence already, like literally, dozens if not hundreds of fair trade farmers organizations and cooperatives already out there, um, you know, and so they are in many cases already certified. Um, but the reality is, is that I think in the cocoa marketplace, I think only about 50% of that cocoa is actually sold under fair trade terms. The rest of it just goes out into the conventional marketplace um, and farmers aren't compensated fairly for it. Um, so in reality, there in many cases have um, a number of pre-existing organizations and it's best and easiest just to partner directly with them. So there's great networks um, through Fairtrade International, for example, um, where you can get connected primarily um, with different producer organizations. And that's really, I would say the best sort of jumping off point. Um, in our particular case, we were working in, or we are working in, you know, ingredients or raw materials that are not like your typical fair trade uh, ingredient like, you know, cocoa or tea or coffee, where there's a great network and established organization. So in our particular case, in, in the case of Ghana, um, we, there was a local NGO actually working uh, with women artisans that also happened to work a little bit in the palm oil world. Um, and we found um, in a community and decided that we wanted to sort of pitch this proposal to uh, the farmers in the neighborhood and said, hey, look, you know, we want to invest in a mill here. 
you know, are you interested in going on this journey with us? Uh, and this is sort of our approach. It's, you know, organic and fair trade. Um, and folks, quite frankly, you know, I've noticed this around the world. They're a little bit hesitant because they've actually had a lot of promises from folks in the past, um, either, you know, locals or nationals, internationals or what have you. So there's always a sort of transition time of three to five years, it almost seems, where you have to really build up that trust that you're not going to just, you know, cut and run as soon as uh, times get tough. And so now over time, in this particular place, it's almost 15 years in Ghana, we've actually had a long enough relationship that we can actually have really frank conversations about the realities, you know, both on like the Dr. Bronner's end, and they negotiate the price based upon where they see their biggest challenges. Um, and I would say, you know, without having that sort of on the ground presence and good relationship with farmers, quite frankly, you're just not going to understand that, you know, the price of gasoline all of a sudden shoots up. And of course, then that impacts farmers' livelihoods and their costs. And so it's good to have sort of those direct relationships and really a, an open sort of ongoing two-way communication, um, because without that, it's really hard to be able to understand what's happening. Um, and so I think, you know, that was really clear for a lot of companies during COVID, where if you didn't know what was going on with your partners, then it was really clear that from one day to the next, they could close their doors. And that happened quite a bit. Um, mm -hmm. And, I, you know, to be honest with you, I'm very, very fortunate to work at Dr. Bronner's because uh, the Bronner family has actually committed resources to have a team um, to actually work closely with farmers and make those mm -hmm. investments. Um, and it's, you know, because we don't have shareholders, for example, um, we actually have extra resources, you know, a little bit to be able to work directly with farmers. And so I think that the trends are changing. There are more and more committed brands that are really looking to really co work directly with farmers and actually collaborate in this space as well. And that's really exciting because very few companies can actually afford to really invest all in um, on the ground with farmers organizations. But if a couple of them decide to even collaborate, you know, what we call pre-competitively, maybe they're all in the chocolate business, um, it ultimately becomes a better win for everybody. Um, that means they've got better relationships on the ground. There's more stability for everybody else. Um, and you can actually, you know, sort of develop with farmers and local workers a strategy for, you know, expanding out your impact. So that's at least been our experience. That's interesting. That's fascinating. Thank you. Yeah. And I think there's another message. Oh, I didn't put that. I don't know. There's a question that seems like it's from me, but I didn't actually say that. <laughs> I don't know. I wonder if it's from someone else um, okay. from the yeah, Fair Trade that might be signed in as well. Yeah. So, um, this one here says Does cocoa have any bad or looming fungi? Or bacteria like coffee and bananas and Ryan what's your favorite magic bar? <laughs> <laughs> well yes um, you know in a way cocoa and coffee are very similar in that they uh, would prefer shade and they like to have lots of different neighbors they don't like to be grown all by themselves out in the sun um, and as a result you know some of the things that we've seen particularly in Latin America with coffee like La Roya you know this coffee rust this fungus um, what we've noticed with cocoa as well is just you know, a couple of degrees change, um, you know, generally warmer um, or a change in the rain. The rainy season really has a big impact on like fungal populations in these areas um, or insect populations. And those are really our biggest, two biggest challenges right there. Um, and luckily, you know, our approach has been such that um, in fact, with some just basic what we call practices, um, things like pruning, um, increasing shade cover, for example, and planting other crops, um, that really is able to control a fair amount of uh, these challenges that we're facing and the pest and disease side of things. Um, but one of the biggest things that we've noticed is that you know farmers are always very reluctant to prune a tree or uh, take a tree out and plant a shade tree because they see that as like you're taking basically money out of their bank, right? If, the, if you prune a tree down or you take a tree out, um, there, there's always this concern um, that there isn't going to be enough production. Um, and our goal is to really sort of like get rid of that mentality that has been really it created in West Africa over the last 20, 30, 40 years uh, by chemical companies and, and government extension agents, which is like produce as much cocoa as you can, you know, regardless of the environmental or social impact. And so what we've actually noticed is that you can actually produce uh, more cocoa and food and fiber and fodder for animals um, if you have a diversified system, um, because then, uh, you know, the crops work in symbiosis and it's just a little bit more stable. So if you happen to have 
for some reason, a crazy, um, you know, insect uh, explosion in population and it just decimates your cocoa crop, but you still have other crops to actually rely on, um, then it's just much more stable for you and your family. I um, mean, you don't actually have to go out of business or, or you know, migrate to the, you know, the, the city or, or sell your farm because of one, one or two bad crop losses. And also, do you have a favorite of the bars? Have you been able to try them all yet? <laughs> oh, yeah. No, I, I've okay. had a lot of uh, chocolate <laughs> in the last couple of months. Mm -hmm. um, I really like um, the hazelnut, the whole hazelnut uh, bar. Um, and that the hazelnuts actually come from this really fantastic farmer's organization in Turkey. Um, and they've been a primary supplier of a really old time organic German brand called Rapunzel. And that's how we got in touch with them. And so I just love the taste of like whole nuts and hazelnuts with chocolate. So that's definitely my favorite. But uh, yeah, fingers crossed. We'll, uh, we'll maybe, who knows, we'll, we'll come up with some more crazy, uh, you know, recipes or something. <laughs> Love that. I haven't tried that one yet, but I have tried the um, crunchy hazelnut butter. Um, and that one was my favorite so far. I, I think I've had maybe three of the different bars so far. Mariana, have awesome. you had the chance to, to have them yet? No, Hopefully. you're no. making me wait. Soon after this. Yeah. Yes, I've been looking for them and no, and I think I'm going to put a few orders in the, for the media fair trade club and hopefully somebody will yeah. will travel Vermont media and bring it back to me or something. Uh, yeah. Yes, but I'm, yeah, I can't wait. <laughs> Especially after seeing Julie's video with mm -hmm. all her mm, trying. Oh, that was fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, if anyone and, else has a favorite that they've tried, please put, put it in the chat. We'd love to hear. And um, Pamela yeah, here. is asking um, if it's easily available in stores, especially in California, because she's in the uh, in the Bay Area, like me. Okay. Exactly. Yeah, so I, I'm not so much on the sales side of things, but I think slowly but surely we're getting a greater distribution. Um, so I would say most natural food stores, except for Whole Foods, I think carry um, them at that, plus like Sprouts and Mothers and others. Um, and I have to see who some of the other ones are, but um, we're slowly but surely uh, getting out there. The, the chocolate game, you know, as a soap company, we're relatively new. So we're learning all of the tricks and the trades and it's taken a while for us to figure it out. So hopefully we'll have greater distribution uh, going forward. <sighs> That's great. I'll I'll wait for them here in Vermont. Um, and Ira is raising his hand too. I don't know, Rachel, if you can. Yes. Um, okay, you should be able to. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. So I have another question. Um, you might have addressed this one of your slides, early slides went by pretty quick, but I saw something where it said living wage. So I've been involved with you know fair trade since two thousand five. Our committee and media started, and at a recent conference. For the first time, I heard that there was a difference, you know, that fair trade certification is lifting people out of poverty as a goal, but that's below a living wage. And there was, um, you know, that's what's the distinction between that? And there are some efforts to try to, you know, get people on a, a, a living wage. Yeah, that is a great point, Ira. So the, the, the fair trade conversation continues to evolve and, and grow over time. And so early on, you know, the sort of the, the way sort of fair trade established pricing, at least in the fair trade international world, was by creating a floor price that was pegged to local conditions. And so there was generally like a floor price for Ghana or Mexico or Brazil, for example. Um, and the idea was is like for that single crop, um, how would you in fact be able to ensure that it was fair based upon the requirements of, of, of producing, you know, let's say a ton of cocoa, for example. But what we're realizing over time is that it's not nearly enough just to focus on one single crop or ingredient. So a farmer grows other things other than cocoa. And so, for example, we're looking at places like West Africa, where let's say the average farm family size is you know, four to five people, they may have four to five acres. Um, in fact, if they just grew that, um, that probably and received a fair price for that, which is aspirational, um, that actually doesn't keep them, you know, um, above, you know, the poverty line. It keeps, I should say, I apologize. It keeps them above the poverty line, but it's not a dignified life uh, where they actually have funds to be able to sort of reinvest back into their family, cover things like education and costs like that. So the idea is to continually and aspirationally move up the sort of what we call now the living wage benchmark um, for different areas that takes into effect 
into account all these other aspects as well. So fair trade pricing previously was looking like, all right, what's the cost of production uh, for you know one ton of cocoa? And we want to make sure that we cover that cost plus a you know a profit for farmers. Now we're looking at a much more holistic approach that actually includes uh, farm size, family size, um, and all these other different costs to make sure that we're not just covering a fair price, quote unquote, but we're actually approaching it from a much more holistic approach. So for our particular case with Dr. Bronner's, um, our fair trade certification is fair for life. Uh, we do a what we call a cost of production analysis, um, definitely every year, but sometimes depending upon how crazy the marketplace is, it can happen two or three times a year as well. Like I mentioned, there's all these different variables like uh, currency exchanges, you know, price of petroleum that really impact a, a farmer's livelihood. And so based upon that, then we provide a premium um, for organic on top of the cost of production, then we provide additional fair trade premium. And then on top of that, we provide additional services that all contribute to this. So that's things like uh, zero uh, percent financing for farmers, uh, pre pre financing um, on their harvest, and also is technical ex um, extension and uh, training and things like that. So I think really the goal going forward is trying to figure out how do we have a much more holistic approach to pricing, um, and that's really what Living Wage is trying to accomplish. Great, yeah. So. Dr. Bronner's has been an excellent company for so long. Thank you so much for keeping that up. And I'll just mention real quick, since I'm pretty much organizing the buying club, Dr. Bronner's coconut oil is on there as well at a really, really excellent price. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the plug, Ira. Yeah, that one, that one I tried and it's really good. So that's highly recommended. Great, well, I think we are coming up on the hour and I think I don't see any other questions at the moment. So maybe we'll start wrapping up. Um, I did want to um, mention that Fairtrade Philadelphia is having an event coming up in March. Um, let me just double check the date real quick. I think it's the 24th, uh, yes. So we're gonna do more of a social meetup. So if any of you are in the Philadelphia area and are interested, save the date. It'll probably be um, after um, five or 6 p.m. for those who might be working during the day. Um, we haven't picked the location yet, um, but if you have any thoughts on where we should go to join for maybe a drink or a coffee, that sort of thing, um, we'd love to have you all. Um, and so you can stay tuned for that information through our social media, or I'm also going to put our newsletter sign up in the chat as well. Um, that's mainly where we share um, events and, and things like that. And we'll be sharing the recording of this event after too. Um, Mariana, did you have any, any last notes about media events that you wanted to plug? Uh, thanks, Rachel. Uh, no, not at this point, but I also will put the um, the link to subscribe to our newsletter for anybody who's interested in following up on events or programs. And just uh, in closing, just thank, thanking everyone um, who have participated today and thanking all the campaigns, the sister campaigns mm -hmm. that, um, that make this event successful and bring students and spread the word of fair trade always. Uh, mm -hmm. Ben Crest High School, uh, Penn State University, Brandywine, and of course, uh, Fair Trade Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. And Ryan, thank you. You guys are doing a fantastic work. Keep it up. Yeah. Thank, oh, you. thank you so much. This is really exciting to join you all. Thank you and keep up the good work. Thanks. You too. Thank you. Okay. Bye, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Mm -hmm.